So today's class, uh, the things that I'll be testing you on next week from this booklet will be mostly on unit conversion and surface area and volumes. So I'm going to start immediately by doing some examples on unit conversions. In the, uh, in the cover slide of the booklet, you'll notice that I have this uh, table here. Now, because your test is not in person, your evaluations are not in person, this table is something normally that I give to students in person on a test. And for the sole purpose of its uh, metric and imperial conversions for the most part, like over here, one meter is 3.28 feet. Maybe you didn't know that. You don't have to know that uh, explicitly for a test. That's why you would have this table. And um, it's more important generally for, your, uh, for the program that you do know some of these metric to imperial, imperial conversions. So the big ones would be uh, meters to feet, inches to centimeters, and uh, kilograms and pounds. Those are the big ones. All the other ones you can look up eventually if you need them, but the, the big ones are, are, are mass and length. Uh, the other one, of course, is uh, there's temperature, which we're going to discuss today in class, the Celsius and uh, Fahrenheit conversion. So I'd like you to start off today's class by looking at uh, some conversions. So here's example one. So... Uh, I doubt that there'll be many people having stress with this conversion, but I'm going to talk to you about a formal method that I like to use to convert because I think that students would appreciate something with structure, especially for this. Not because this question is hard, but because we can apply it to harder questions. So, question one. Convert that to meters. So what's the answer? Anybody want to chat me up here? That's correct. So how did you get that answer, uh, Joseph? You divided by 100, I'm assuming. So... No doubt that most of you know that to go from centimeters to meters, you divide by 100. That's good. I'm going to actually use your comment there that one meters is worth 100 centimeters. So here's a, here's a question for you. If I multiply by one, do I, does, does multiplying by one damage this number? Does it change it or, or wreck it or alter it? Hopefully not, right? When you multiply something by one, you don't break anything. But I don't want to multiply by 1 because that doesn't really do anything for me. But I will multiply by the following. 1 meter over 100 centimeters. Can you see why that's useful? What does this fraction equal? What does that fraction equal? It's 1. Thank you, Vittorio. Yeah, that's 1. Because although it doesn't explicitly say 1, the top and the bottom are worth the same. Because the top and the bottom are worth the same, then the fraction's one. And when you multiply by one, you don't wreck this number. And then you can see that the centimeters cancel. And that's the dust end of it. So you get 541 over 100 meters, which is 5.41 meters. I don't care if you write all this stuff out. All I'm doing is presenting to you a strategy that would be useful when the question is complicated or at least annoying at some point for you that it's not obvious to me anymore, especially if it's like squared or something. So let's try another one like that. Whoops. So, so I know that one kilometer is worth a thousand meters. So if you don't mind, I'm not going to ask you too many questions in the chat for the first few examples because they're pretty quick. 
and I, I'm just trying to move along with some of the easier stuff. And then we'll get to the harder ones where I'll, I'll prompt you more for questions. So we know that there are 1,000 meters in a kilometer. So do I put the kilometer on the top or on the bottom? And the answer is on the bottom because you want them to cancel. So there it is. So then you would multiply 0 0.273 by 1,000 to get 273 meters. And you can cancel out those kilometers. So, so for those that just arrived, it's no problem. We're just doing a couple of easy unit conversion questions to get started. Okay, back to question three. Convert liters to meters cubed. Now, okay, so 144 liters. I need to think of a fraction that is equivalent for liters and meters cubed. This one here. If you don't know it, it's it's actually told to you right here somewhere. I'm giving that to you. So I recommend that you have this sheet in front of you if you're uh, doing any conversions. Not necessarily for this course, but just in general. This booklet's a bit of a gem. Not because I wrote it. I'm not saying like that. But between page one, which is all of the units and the uh, prefixes, and this table here, these are golden for your uh, estimating courses and your building science courses. So yeah, it's a neat thing to have. So I'm going to ask you guys, how many, how many, how many uh, liters are in a meter cubed? Does anybody know? Hmm. It's a thousand. Yeah. So one cubic meter is pretty big. One liter is equal to, uh, it's a decimeter cubed, but I don't want to write decimeters right now. I want to stick to the units that are on the page. So in this case, you divide by a thousand. Okay, there's probably some people wondering, I see meters cubed here. Do I have to cube something? Is it a thousand cubed? And the answer is no, you're not cubing the thousand because liters of all the units that you see so far, units for liters are weird because liter is a volume, although the unit itself is not explicitly cubed. So go have fun with that, right? That's kind of weird. How are you with the pace, everybody? You feel good about the pace? Is it is it okay? Is the pace okay? Okay. All right, I'm going to keep on going here. Cruise control. I'll wait till everybody uh, is uh, kind of in the energy today. 314 centimeters squared. So this one's interesting because we have centimeters squared. Now, I know centimeters to decimeters pretty much uh, in my head, but maybe you don't know it off the top of your head. That's why I have this lovely chart on the first page. So you see here, centimeters and decimeters are related to the prefixes deci and centi. Deci means 0.1 and centi means 0 0.01. So they differ by a factor of 10. Also, centi is smaller than deci. So that means there's 10 centimeters in one decimeter. So if that was too much for you to handle, you have the ability to use Google for like, you know, conversions, especially since we're in the online format. So if you Google a conversion, I don't care. It's fine. It's just that it might slow you down for other things. So I know that 10 centimeters is worth one decimeter. But the thing is, if I just write that, that's no good. What's the problem with this? It, it, like, look over here, right? See the leaders? The leaders cancel. That's great. Do, do these cancel? Do these centimeter things cancel? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, they don't cancel. So what we got to do now is we got to write it twice. Yeah, Joseph, you want to square it, right? You got 
Yeah, you want to square it, okay? So what I'm going to do is instead of squaring this, I'm just going to copy it twice. It's the same thing, okay? Like I know this is a little bit funny for me to write like that. It's a little bit maybe overkill. But the thing is, is I got a, I got a keyboard, right? So I can copy and paste. You don't have the keyboard, so it's probably more of a pain in the ass to like write it twice anyway. So I'm going to do that. And let's see what happens here. So now centimeter squared is going to cancel with the centimeters. So in effect, we're not dividing by 10, we're dividing by 100. And I can collect the decimeters and put decimeters squared. So that's, that's the game we're going to play here. I don't know how this popped in here. That's weird. That's the game we're going to play for the remaining. Uh, I'm just going to look at my notes here. We're going to do 13 of these. Can you handle 13 of them? Hopefully. I'm doing it for your benefit. Not because I'm trying to put you to sleep with unit conversions on Tuesday morning. Okay. A rectangle has dimensions that by that. Determine the area. Oh, oh, crap. In square meters. All right, all right. 52 centimeters times 591 centimeters. Okay, let's just get that out of the way. So that equals, I have it on my notes somewhere here. 326232. 326232 centimeters squared. So you know on the uh, on the my lab when you're entering your quizzes, don't put any funny stuff. Don't put comma. Don't put a comma. Just leave it like that. Leave it like a raw number. It, it might say that you got it wrong, but I'll go back and I'll correct it. And 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 uh, although I haven't posted the marks yet because. I had to process all of the marks for all the sections. I went through everybody's quiz one by one, and I made sure that if anything was marked as incorrect by the computer system, I went back manually and gave you the credit. So basically, the quizzes were all done really well. Either everybody got, either you got perfect or you got one wrong. Nobody got more than one wrong, just so you know. So that should make you feel good. This doesn't make me feel good, though. I don't want centimeters squared. I want meters squared. But I know that 100 centimeters is worth one meter. But this time, maybe I'll just use the brackets because that's probably what you're better off doing anyway. I'll do that. And then, then you're good. So this thing here is one meter per hundred centimeter all squared. So what are we going to divide 326, 3, 232 by? Do we divide by 100? What do we divide by, really? Yes, thank you, 10,000. So if we divide by 10,000, we're going to move that decimal four times. And we want three significant digits. So I'm going to do three sig figs as well. So that's 32.6 meters squared. So there's a nice bold question. So all of those questions that we just did involved uh, metric conversion to metric conversion. The nice thing about when you convert from metric to metric is all of the conversion factors are multiples of 10 or powers of 10, like 10, 100. We're doing unit conversions. We're just converting units, and I'm just giving you random things to convert units with. So we've just done like four or five unit conversion questions. So those first five questions were all in the metric system. The next question, number six, is not in the metric system. It's a conversion between metric and imperial. See, we have 481 inches, and we want to convert to feet. So this is actually, this is imperial. Does anybody know how many inches are in a foot? 
Thank you. So I'm going to put one foot on top and 12 inches on the bottom. So 481 divided by 12. And we're going to round that, of course. So four and change, 40.1, sorry. I was just doing mental math there. So if I say something funny, it's because I'm just thinking out loud. Don't mind me. I'm, I'm sure you know more than one person in your life that thinks out loud, and sometimes it might be annoying. It might be you. Hey, then we're very much alike. So uh, anyway, so these ones are also very quick. 8.25 yards. Now, maybe you don't know what yards are to inches, but that's okay. Because you can go from yards to feet, and then you can go from feet to inches. So I'll do that here. I'll say that there are three feet and one yard. If you didn't know that, that's pretty important that you know that. Look, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bug you if you don't know yards to inches or yards to feet, but you might encounter a professor later that will be like, "Wow, you don't know that," and I don't want you to be embarrassed. So I want you to know it so that you that you're confident when you're having those conversations. So 12 inches to one foot. So if you want, you could have done this faster by just doing 36 inches. So if we multiply by 36, you get 297 yards. Uh, sorry, inches. Yeah, I'm not here to pick on you. I'm here to help you fill the gaps in. Nobody's here to pick on you. We're here to help you. Okay. Now, I'm going to keep on the pace a little bit here because these are very short. And I'll slow down when we do metric to imperial because those are weirder. So 10,000 feet. So if you don't know how many feet are in a mile or yards or whatever, there's a table on page three here that I've made for you. And it's just up at the top here. So it's the second block, which is uh, metric, uh, sorry, imperial to imperial. One mile is 5280 feet. So you can go back here. And say that one mile is the same value or the same amount as 5280 feet. So we're in fact, like if you just say here, I want to divide by 5,280, that's cool, do that. I'm using this here with a fraction because it's, it helps you when the questions are very weird. I'm just saying that for anybody that came late. Uh, so that's 1.89 uh, miles and that's approximate. All right, cruising along, I want to do about five more of these within reasonable time. So if you didn't see the answers here in the side tab, so we're going to go to question nine now. So this is a rectangle has dimensions of that by that. Determine the area in square feet. Uh, a question, again, that involves, um, for the most part, For the most part, something that's not too complicated, hopefully. Okay, here we go. 125 inches by 78.2 inches, which is 9775 inches squared. But we don't want inches, we want feet. How many inches in a foot? It's in the chat already. That's 12 inches to one foot. But I went quick on the easy stuff because I think what I have here should be fairly easy after the first eight that we've done. What's wrong with this? Can I just, is this gonna be good? What I've written here, this one over 12? Or, or do we have to do something? Yeah, you got to square it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You got to square it. Very good. Let's cross that out. Whoops. Cut that out here. And now we're in business. So you don't divide by 12, you divide by 144. So this kind of thing that I'm showing you here is going to help you because it's uh, it'll help you understand why it's not 
it's not 12 and you can argue it better to somebody. So anyway, if you divide by 144, you're going to get something nice. Hopefully, I got 67.9 square feet. I did these calculations earlier, so I don't uh, waste too much time asking you for the calculation. Um, also, because there's a lot of stuff to do, to, a lot of small stuff to do today. You're not going to encounter too many difficult questions today. It's just a lot of small things that I'd like to cover. Just to make sure uh, that you have competency for uh, for the program. Anyway, uh, a cube, a cube has an edge length of that. So we know that the volume of a cube is length times width times height. But since the length, width, and the height are all the same, then you can actually just put it into one thing, one term, 9,800.344 cubic feet. But the question doesn't want cubic feet. The answer is supposed to be in cubic yards. So this time, I'm anticipating a cube there. How many feet are in a yard? Thank you. That's the conversion. Thank you, Kabir. So, 9,800.344, not divided by 3, but divided by 3 to the 3. And 3 to the 3 is 27. So this is approximately 363 cubic yards. I'm going to talk to you about something that's a little bit confusing to people, but it's something that you're going to encounter, in, in the, especially with the construction part of your program. So... A cubic yard, you could write it like this as a unit. You could write C-U-Y-B, or you can write yard cubed. As a, as a math and physics guy, I hate this one. The reason I hate it is because, oh, yeah, it's easy to type. It's easy to write on a spreadsheet, but look at it. You don't see the power of three, and you don't explicitly remember necessarily that it's 27 that's the factor. So that's why I'm not a fan of it. But in construction, yeah, definitely it is a bit uglier too. And you know what else that bugs me, Shaquille, here? There's a minus sign. So someone might read that, has no clue about math, and be like, is that a minus sign? Is it CU minus YD? Am I doing a formula? Like, that's bad. <laughs> so... Things like that, I like the exponent because it's crystal clear. You'll, but like other ones that you probably know anyway, like this one's easy, okay, here. Here's an easy one. This is one that less people are likely to get uh, to get thrown off by, is uh, square feet. Because you've been to Home Depot enough times to know square feet. So that's fine. If you see that, like, but by the same token, I don't like it. So... I prefer to have it like a formula, like a power. Anyway, that's enough me complaining. It's too early in the morning to complain. So I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to take you back here. The next question is, uh, is meters and feet. So now we have a little bit of an issue. So if we look over here, there's a beautiful little chart that I made. And this is a conversion that you should know reasonably well if there's one thing leaving out of this class that i hope that you remember it's that one meter is approximately 3.28 feet I, i'm not going to ask you to remember that as a random fact but it does come in handy to know especially in construction so 2.151 feet is going to be one meter is approximately 3.28 feet So you would divide by 3.28 and get something there. 
meters. So these last set of questions that we're doing are just converting from uh, metric to imperial or vice versa. And because metric and imperial don't have exact conversion factors, every answer is going to be approximately equals. It doesn't matter how simple the computation might appear. So here's another one. This time, this time we have meters squared. So that means we're going to square the conversion. But the fraction here, this fraction here is approximately one. We need to write it upside down because we want the meters to cancel and the meters have to go to the bottom to do that. So ultimately, this is going to become 8.11 times 3.28 squared. And the answer will be in feet squared. That middle step might confuse people. So if you don't like this step here, don't write it down at all. Just execute it correctly on your calculator. So basically the red thing, the red thing is what the red thing is the numbers that I'm pushing on my calculator. 87.3 square feet. Little things to look for. You should know that feet are smaller than meters. Since feet are smaller than meters, then you would expect there to be more square feet within a square meter, which is true. I don't know what the exact conversion is, um, but I do know offhand roughly uh, a square meter, a square meter is between 10 and 11 square feet. No, so if you want, if you're doing a very quick estimate, just use the number 10, although I think it's actually closer to 11. So for example, if you're, uh, if you're measuring, a, if you have a blueprint of, a, of a, a condominium or something and it's in Europe, they'll say square meters. So let's say the condominium is 30 square meters. It'll sound, oh, that's a small number. That's a small condo. But if you convert it to square feet, it's still a small condo. It's 300 square feet. But anyway, that was a bad example. But yeah, multiply by 10 roughly for square meters to square feet. Although for a better representation, it's closer to 11. Okay, uh, number 13. So there's a conversion for liters to cubic inches somewhere, and you can look it up here on the second page again. So one liter, if I just look for it here, it's right here. It's 61.02 cubic inches. So you see me, like, I, I mean, my background is pretty strong with numbers, and I still look stuff up. There's nothing wrong with that. Actually, the interesting thing is, even though I was trained as an engineer, because I studied in Canada, we barely did, in all of engineering, we barely did any imperial uh, units, which was a little bit frustrating because when you go into higher level um, mathematics and physics, you need to know those things because of all of the um, back and forth with the American industry. I studied at the University of Toronto, Anthony. I was at U of T. I did uh, engineering science. I did I did my master's, uh, my undergrad, and my PhD, all of them at U of T. Although uh, although I did have uh, opportunities to uh, do MIT and uh, and even do a postdoc at NASA, I just chose to stay in Canada. That's another story. I didn't write an SAT. I didn't write an S I didn't never wrote the SAT because I didn't apply to the states for university. I was talking about uh, for grad school for those things. Um, yeah, I did write the uh, what did I write? Uh, my friend was studying for the GMAT. You know the GMAT? That's the one for the MBAs. You know MBA whatever the GMAT. Thank you. I did the GMAT as a joke. He goes, why don't you just do the GMAT? Because he had paid for it anyway, and he had an extra test online. 
So as a joke, I just wrote it on the fly without a calculator or nothing. I don't, if I tell you my score, you might get upset. You can see the grid on my face. I got, I got, I got in the 99th percentile. 99, over 99%. Yeah. Yeah. I just did it as a joke, though. Yeah, uh, that's what you do. That's what you do when you write tests all your life, bro. Uh oh, I'm a goat again. Did you notice? Speaking of goat, not that I'm saying he is or he isn't. I think he is. Did you notice Michael Jordan? He changed his name. He put his middle name now. In and when he does communications, it's not he doesn't. It's not Michael Jordan. He puts Michael. Um. He puts his middle name, which is I forget his middle name. It's like Kenneth or Joseph or something. Anyway, he put it because of the actor Michael B. Jordan. I just thought that was funny. Um. Yeah. The. the if you uh, has any, if you've written the SAT, you know that the math part is pretty much like all over the place from high school. I think. Let's do one of these conversions, everybody. You wrote the SAT. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to make of it. Like my buddy is studying for medical school, and he's writing the uh, MCAT, the the medical school one. <laughs> I saw the MCAT, the physics, the physics component, and uh, like the average, like on a sample test, the average was like 50 or 60 percent. That's that's some intense. That's like that's just a beatdown. Like anyway, so you get like really talented people writing these things. And Anthony, I'm pretty sure you're a bright person too. Like it's just the the averages are set low. I guess they need to just really spread out the average i'm not a fan of making things too hard i want things reasonable anyway we should move on everybody i'm sorry uh 4.63 meters to feet and inches so this question is a little bit different because i call this the home depot question a lot of home depot pro promotion or they'll call it the rona question let's give some uh you know variety there um so you go and you're you're measuring you're measuring your uh, your place, and all you have is metric equipment. So you got your tape measure, and I know your tape measure has inches as well, but let's just say it didn't. So you have 4.63 meters, and then you go to Home Depot, and you're like, I need a piece of wood that's 4.63 meters. But when you go to there, and let's say they say to you, oh, you need to tell us in feet and inches. Let's just say they say that, okay? So then the question is, how do you convert it? Or you know what? That My example is kind of lame. Let's pick an example. Like you look at a blueprint. And the blueprint says 4.63 meters, but then you need to know the measurement in feet and inches because the contractor you have needs to know the information in feet and inches. That's that's probably more practical for you. So anyway, let's convert that to feet and inches. So the first thing you want to do is convert it to meters, uh, from meters to feet. So we know that one meter, if you recall from earlier discussion, one meter and I put it on the bottom to cancel, is worth 3.28 feet. So let's get that into feet, and then we'll talk business. So that's approximately, uh, let's see here. I got 15 and change, 15.1864. And again, I apologize that I'm not asking you too much for like your calculations. Because we're doing a lot of small calculation stuff today, I figured I would save us time by me just pre doing the calculations in advance. So uh, at least for this lesson. So anyway, you get that. Now, the question is not that. The question is uh, feet and inches. And don't worry about this quarter inch stuff yet. So this thing here is no good to us. I'm just going to do the following. I'm going to say that uh, the answer. No, 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 Julian, this lesson is going to be two hours. And the third hour is the quiz and extra help. So the quiz will always be the third hour at the beginning. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, the quiz will always be the third hour at the beginning. Uh, that, I just need to have it like that because I need everybody to have structure. So I don't want to screw anybody up if they miss a week or if they're late or whatever. So be always, always be prepared to write at 11. Although you'll have an hour window, the quiz will be half an hour. 
Of course, if you have accommodation or something, you might have extra time given. That's different. Okay. So I know the final answer is this. 15 feet. But now I need to know what it is in inches. So that's kind of like where we're trying to get things. So we're going to keep on going here. We're going to take this feet here. And we're going to take the decimal part. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss the uh, I'll discuss it uh, toward the actual thing toward the actual quiz but I think it's I think it's six questions or seven maybe but I, I don't remember this quiz uh, today's quiz will be uh, a tougher one than last week's uh, thank you I'm not not tougher one to like destroy anybody yeah yeah it's based on last week the the quizzes are the quizzes are always delayed by one week so I won't test you on today for the quiz. It'll be last week's or maybe the week two of before that, because it's the, the first week's material was not very dangerous. Okay. So I'm going to take the decimal part, 15 point, sorry, 1.864 feet. I'm going to multiply that by a fraction that converts it to inches. So that's 12 inches per one foot. So now we have a, uh, we have something in terms of inches. So we take the fraction part, which is not a complete foot, and we convert it to inches. And that way we get uh, roughly this, 2.2368 inches. So now go down to the answer. So now we know it's two inches, but we don't know the fraction. We don't know what this is, but we do know that it's over four. Why is it over four? Because the question wants quarter inch. So then what you do is you take the decimal part of the inches and you ask yourself 0 0.2368 inches. What fraction is it closest to? Is it closer to one quarter or two quarters or three quarters? Just looking at it, can you tell what it is? What fraction is that closest to? Yeah. I think it's closest to a quarter because it's a quarter is 0.25. So that's how you can answer the question. One quarter. 0.1864. I just took the, I see this thing here. That's, that's all feet. The 15 feet, I put it over here because it's a whole value. And then the decimal part is the leftovers, which doesn't make a full foot. And I'm going to convert that into inches and then continue like that. So Shaquille, it's like a filter. If you can imagine a filter, you take the leftover stuff and then you process that. So you take the decimal stuff and convert it into inches. And then you take the decimal of the inches and go again. So it's like a, it's like a sieve. You keep on filtering it out until you get smaller things. Is that okay? So Kabir, uh, you, uh, you want to approximate based on the instruction in the question. So it says quarter inch. Now I'm going to do something here, which is a little bit more structured. Maybe you don't, maybe someone doesn't see that that's closer to one quarter. One thing you can do is you can multiply by four over four. Now you might be like, John, what are you doing? You just multiply by four over four. Or you're just doing nothing. You're multiplying by one, but look at that. If you if you take the two three six eight and you multiply by the numerator, you get the following: zero point nine four seven two over four inches, and then that's approximately to the nearest integer. That's a roughly one quarter of an inch. So that's the that's the way that you can do it in a more structured. Uh, like I write computer programs, that's how I would write a computer program to do it. I would I would do that. I would I would actually code it like that. So I want you to try the next one as on your own, not now, for homework as an exercise is 15. It's the same idea, but it's it's not quarter inch, it's sixteenth of an inch. And I'll put that one on black for blackboard for you. So uh anyway. Would you repeat the 4-4? Four, four? Sure, sure. No problem. Okay. So I have 0.2368 inches. I need to get that to the closest fraction out of four because the question says quarter inch. 
So what I do is I multiply by 4 over 4, because 4 over 4 is 1. And then what I can do is take the 0.2368 and multiply by 4. Or if you want, you can write it like this as well. You can put this over 1. And you see top times top, bottom times bottom, and you get this. Now, this thing here is easier for you to locate if it's closer to 0, 1, or 2 for the numerator. So what you're doing is you're tuning it a little bit easier to read. Got it. Cool. So I'm going to show you something hilarious. This is actually, I don't know, you can write apps and things like that. I'm more of like a nuts and bolts programmer. So yeah, n not n I, I've written stuff like that, Irvin, but not like with the pretty screen or anything, just like a keyboard style. Okay, uh, so, so 15, you're going to try on your own. And we're going to do 16 together, and then we'll take the break after. I just need, like, I need to move it along, and it's my bad for talking about, like, GMATs and SATs or whatever. So, anyway, I'd like to do question 16 with you. Sorry, not 16, 17. 17, I meant. So, I'm going to be skipping a, a lot of these questions, and it's not for the sake of, like, uh, I don't want to show you it. It's... Uh, I'm picking the ones that are most interesting or relevant and also cover a variety of, uh, of uh, topics. This booklet is not a booklet that is intended for you to be an expert on by the end of today or by the end of this week because there's lots of formulas in here and, uh, and I'm not asking you to learn all these formulas. I'm just asking you to like how you, if you see a formula, how to, how to process it. So we're going to do this one question here. And then we'll take a break, and then I'll show you what I mean by formulas and what have you. So the question here is a conversion from uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit. So I was at my buddy's place, uh, the one studying for med school. It was hilarious. And uh, we were arguing about a conversion from, Celsius, from Celsius to Fahrenheit. So I thought that was pretty cool. But uh, Anyway, there's a neat conversion here. It's just that you do 9 over 5 times the temperature in Celsius, and then you add 32. So this question is kind of the, the type of question that you should be able to, to process in terms of your program. You're going to encounter some random formula, or you're going to look it up and say, I need to use it to do something. So in this case, it says, find the equivalent temperature in Fahrenheit for 28.5 Celsius. So the temperature in Fahrenheit, so this is question one. So what do you do? What do you do here? What do I put here? What do I put in the box? Anybody? Yeah, 28.5. And then that equals, uh, I got 83.3. Okay. Sometimes people don't put the degree symbol on the Fahrenheit. That's fine. If you just put 83.3F, it's fine. Okay. The second question is a little bit more exhausting. Because this time, so that was part one. So question two, we're given the cell at a Fahrenheit temperature, which is 72, and we're asked to convert to Celsius. So what does that equal? How do you solve that? Uh, not so much fun anymore. I'm going to work it out sideways. Yes, very good work. I'm going to move over the 32 and get 40 equals 9 over 5 TC. 
Same, similar what you're doing, Irvin. I'm just writing it down that with more uh, with more steps in between. So if you want to get rid of the nine over five, then you can multiply the 40 by five over nine, which is exactly what you have in the chat. So Celsius temperature is 200 divided by nine, which is 20 ish. It's a uh, 22.2 Celsius. So the first thing you want to do is you want to take the 32 here and you want to move it to the other side. So that's what I did. I took the 32 and I moved it to the other side. So I got 72 minus 32. And then that's how you get 40. Okay, Ralph? You're welcome. And then over here, I want to get rid of the 9 over 5. So what I'm going to do is multiply both sides by the reciprocal, which is 5 over 9. So this last question is a typo. I just noticed it right now, actually. So I got to fix that typo. I'll make that correction before I post the answers on Blackboard. So sorry about that. Anyway, um, you want to solve for Celsius in terms of Fahrenheit. So the, the purpose of this last question is what if you had a what if you had to do this calculation here a bunch of times, right? You don't want to do it every single time. It's annoying. What if you could just create the formula itself without doing that? So that's what I'd like to do right now briefly, and then we'll take a break. So you have TF equals uh, 9 over 5 PC plus 32. So this is exactly on the same line of thinking as Irvin had in the uh, chat there. So what you want to do is just uh, solve for TC. And we're going to practice rearranging formulas after the break. What you can do here is move the 32 over. And then to get rid of the 9 over 5, you can multiply both sides by 5 over 9. And that's the answer. I don't want to write it backwards because it's going to run off the page. Uh, yeah, Kabir, it's it's uh, you got to put brackets on the TF minus 32, but you have the right idea. It's just there's a bracket missing. That's what I was saying with Urban's too. Is the the bracket was missing. That's all. What that means is that if you follow the uh, mass. You put this, you subtract 32 first, and then you multiply by 5 over 9. All right. So, anyway, uh, hopefully, the stuff we did at the beginning today wasn't, today's first hour wasn't too dangerous. For the most part, it consisted of converting units. And I just started to mess around a little bit with uh, formulas. What we're going to do in the second hour is continue with just talking about some formulas, rearranging them and such. And, uh, and then maybe a couple of surface area and volume calculations. Some of these questions that we cover today and that are in this book are difficult for me to test you on because uh, I don't have a direct comparison to the textbook for that. And they're not intended to be tested on everything. So like, like I'm not, a lot of the formulas I'm going to present in the second hour I'm not testing you on them as, a, as a, a, something that you should know and study for, like, oh, it's a formula that you should have known. It's just, here's a formula that you might encounter. How would you, like, rearrange it, and what are the units? That's the kind of stuff I want you to really um, focus on. Okay, so the short answer there is, Anthony, uh, the, the, uh, the, the quiz today 
is based on mostly last week's work and potentially connects to the first week as well, but not directly. Like in the first week, you had to solve an equation. In the second week, you got to rearrange a formula. So it's kind of like kind of the same thing. So uh, the this week's quiz is based primarily off of last week. That's the short answer. So yeah, question, you're welcome. I don't want to say it is question 30 onward. Like I, I'm selecting questions. When I when I make the quizzes, I select questions that match the, uh, the section in the book that I've asked you to look at. So that's why like it's deliberate like that for my part. I'm not trying to trick anybody. But material in this course has a, a, a cumulative nature to it. So I'm, I'm not trying to exaggerate, but like if a, if a question in week one has multiply and then the second week has add, well, you still need to fill out a multiply. You get you don't throw that away. Yeah, exactly. So the quiz the quiz will have uh, some elements of variation in it. Um, and uh, some stuff that we did prior to that. I'm just trying to go from memory, but um, like uh, maybe uh, I think one question is to make an equation and solve it, kind of like the bridge girders and things. Not the same question, but that kind of question where you made a linear equation. Um, yeah, I'll talk to you. Uh, I got my notepad in the other room, and I'll grab it right before we do the quiz, and I'll and I'll just kind of give you a, 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 a heads up on it. The one thing you'll notice about this week's quiz that's different than last week is I, I've made the questions not worth one anymore. I found out how to do that. So like the, the quiz is out of 15, like the first question's three marks. Not It's not a hard question, but it's worth three marks. But then the second question might be two marks and the third question's one mark. I believe there are six or seven questions. I wrote the quiz because it's randomized numbers and everything. I wrote the quiz myself to test it because I like to do that to make sure that if I can't do it, well, how the heck are you might going to do it? I know there's some bright people here, but I'm just saying, you know, I, if I'm the professor, hell yeah, I, I better be able to finish it quick too. So I did the quiz without cheating or using, um, like the numbers are all scrambled for every question. It took me six minutes to write it. So if it takes me six minutes, I multiply by five, which is very fair because that's a good factor of time. And uh, yeah, and anyway, so 30 minutes is more than enough time. And the thing is, is that I'm not designing the quiz that uh, it's going to ruin anybody. But also, if you want to get a high mark, like over 90 on it, you got to you got to be quick and you got to be good. So maybe the class average on the quizzes is going to be like uh 82 or 84 or whatever maybe it's 89 maybe it's 90. we'll see it's a it's a work in progress right sometimes like if i make the quiz too hard then the next week i'll make it easier i'll dial it back i just need to find out as a group where everybody is so anyway let's continue so uh we're gonna go and do something like question 20 now so the purpose of question 20 is to simulate what you would encounter in everyday life uh, as a manager where you grab a formula or you're given a formula and you have to know how to use it so here's a formula representing power whether or not you've studied physics the purpose of this lesson is not to teach you what power is and to derive the formal physics uh approach here i'm just trying to tell you hey look i found a formula about power I need to know how to use it. That's all That's all the purpose is for today. We're going to do this for one formula. We'll try it for another one. And if we have time, we'll do it for another one. But the, the majority of, of uh, the material for this uh, hour will be on surface area and volumes. So I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on these formulas. And what I recommend that you do on your own is there's about, I think, 10 of these types of questions. Just do a couple every week. And you're not going to be uh, explicitly tested on creating a formula. But maybe on your midterm, I might give you a formula and say, you know, rearrange it or put some numbers in it or, or apply it, in other words. So here's the formula for power. One thing that's useful for you to know right off the bat 
is what the units are and what the symbols are for each of the quantity. So the first thing that I'd like you to do is in this column here, just write down the symbols for power, energy, and time. And it's not, it's not like something uh, profound because in the question, it just tells you what they are. So power is P, energy is E, and time is T. I gotta type them separately. That's very unfortunate. Yeah, the question will be mostly on var a lot of variation. In it. Yes. Whatever we did last week is on your quiz. Bottom line. What are the units for power? What are the units for power? Yep. And the symbol unit is W. Oops. Thank you. What are the units for energy? This is straight from the question. You just have to read the question. Yep. And the units for time are seconds. Good work. That's all I'm asking there. So on the side here, <laughs> no, no, I don't, I'm not promoting any brands. Uh, on the side here, I'd like you to figure out what the formula is for energy. So solve for E. What does E equal? Yeah, that's correct. Energy is power times time. Very good. And what does time equal? I will say that after your first quiz, thank you for that, by the way. Um, I will say for the first quiz, most of you, like the rearranged formula stuff, you absolutely nailed it. So this is something that I encourage you to do when you encounter a new formula. It's always try to go through and see that you can rearrange the formula all the different ways. So in building science, you're gonna encounter many, many formulas. And a lot of them are going to be weird. The number one thing that you can do with formulas is, for me, is make a table like this, like kind of an index card or a reference sheet. And then when you go to building science, you're laughing because not only do you have the formula, you've kicked the crap out of it. Look, you got all the symbols, you got all the units, you got all the formula arranged every way. So no matter what circumstance or thing you have to solve for, it's already in front of you. So if you're like, oh, crap, i got to solve for energy. No, you don't have to rearrange it. It's right here on your reference sheet. So that's what I'm telling you about this booklet. This booklet has a bunch of these formulas that you use in building science. Take it. Use my solutions if you want. Derive it on your own if you want. And just fill in all those tables. And then you can use those tables in that course. For, the, for this question, I'd like to also uh, do an example calculation. So in this question, it says calculate the power, and it gives you some information. So we know power is energy over time. Why? Because it's in the formula. But maybe if we had to solve for energy or time, we're still laughing because we have already created our little formulas here on the side. Anyway, the energy in this question is what? How much energy was consumed? Anybody? How, many, how much energy was consumed? Yeah. And what does the capital, what, what does the capital, uh, thank you. What does the capital M stand for? What does this guy stand for? Mega. Very nice. And what does mega, how much is mega worth? Do you remember what mega is worth as a number? That's correct. It's it's millions. Very good. Now you know you know minutes is one hundred twenty seconds. Whoops. So mega is worth a million. So this is a million here. 
I'm going to write it out full, but I like how you wrote 10 to the 6, so I'm going to write it better that way. That's an easy one to remember, mega and millions. There's a nice alliteration there. So then you're good. You just do that on your calculator, and you'll get 1, 2, 7. Well, I'll just do it to three significant digits. You get 12,000, uh, sorry, 128,000 watts. The question though wants it in kilowatts. So kilowatts is much like kilometers. Uh, 10 to the six, yeah, sorry, that's my typo. That's my bad. I'm a keyboard ninja today, right? Thank you for the correction. Okay. So that's what you're going to encounter for the remaining uh, types of questions with with formulas. Oh, sorry, it's just 120. Yeah. Wow. I'm having a good day today. You can tell. I guess I shouldn't write the GMAT today. I probably would not do too well. Thank you for that. Okay. So uh, hopefully you're laughing. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about another question involving a formula. Which part? Which part, Shaquille? Okay, I'm not getting any feedback. I'm gonna, okay, yeah, so here, this M here stands for the word mega. Mega is worth 1 million. So if you go to the top page of the, of the book, right here, capital M, this is page one, capital M is worth 1 million, just like K is worth 1,000 or any other of these prefixes. So 10 to the 6, so 1 million is 10 to the 6, which is what I'm literally doing is I'm replacing the capital M with 10 to the 6. I'm replacing the capital M with 10 to the 6. Sounds good? Okay. And conversely, I'm actually making this number smaller because I'm replacing the 1,000 with the K. I don't want to, I'll highlight it in red, although it kind of pains me to do that, but I'll do that there because I, I should put an extra step there, but that's fine. Anyway, uh, we're going to try another one of these questions where I give you a formula. I want you to rearrange it every possible way, and then we're going to take it for a test drive and do some calculations. That's what you see with a whole bunch of these questions that I've put forward. So I'm, I'm, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to do a lot of these. I usually do a couple in class because there's too many of them to do in a, in a, in a realistic time frame. So I'm going to pick 27. So here's 27. Now this one's cute because you've seen this one already. We saw this on our, on your assignment last week. Remember on your quiz. Remember we had you who had this on their quiz? Not everybody, but most people. I'd say about half the class might have had it on their quiz. PV equals NRT. Yeah, Pavnert. <laughs> yeah, so I just want you to quickly here fill in these uh, formulas, VNRT. <laughs> yeah, especially if you've taken chemistry, right? Good old days, or physics even. So anyway, V, let's solve for V. So V equals what? I'm going to just copy and paste this quickly, and then we'll fill them in quickly together. That's right. Honestly, I was very impressed with your, uh, with your uh, quizzes that you actually just dismantled these questions. But that's why I chose this one, just kind of as a, as a thank you for that. Yeah. So V is NRT over P. And then what is N? 
That's the one that was on your quiz, I think, if I can remember. N is PV over RT, yeah. So you can see that on your quiz next week, rearranging formulas might be in play again. Like I might ask you to rearrange another formula just because it fits this type of question. R, what is R? Yep, good work. R is PV over NT or TN, that's fine. I like putting the lowercase letter first because I'm weird. Anyway, let's do the lower the next one here. Uh T. What T? Yeah. Guy, you are nailing that one question. You've been you've been uh, on a roll today. So I haven't given you too many props, but I'm giving you props now. So there you go. Okay. All right. So uh, anyway, what I want you to feel confident about is that if you get a formula from physics or any other discipline that's weird with formulas, that you are comfortable to rearrange the formula and then put it to use. So if we go to the next question, 28, you're putting it to use. Calculate the pressure. So before I even remember what the question is or what to do, the question says calculate the pressure. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to steal the formula for pressure, which is right here. It's NRT over V. And I'm going to write that down right away. NRT over V. Okay, I think we're good. So I need to, in advance of this question, I need to know a few things. I need to know what N is. I need to know what R is. I need to know what T is, and I need to know what V is. I'll do T last. So N is, if, if you're like, oh, I don't remember what these symbols mean. I forget all these symbols, no problem. Just go back here and look up N. N is number of particles in moles, okay? So look for moles. So here's moles. Where's moles? Moles, moles. Here you go. 3.12 moles. Okay. No problem. R, R is a special constant, which uh, is, is not given. Yeah, it's given. It's 8.31. And uh, I'm just going to look carefully here. You can use either value for R. So I'm just going to use the kilopascal one. Liters, moles, and so you could, in this table here, you could use either value for R. R could be either of these. I just chose the second one because that's the one that I see most often in references. Instead of using atmospheres of pressure, I'm using kilopascals of pressure. So what that means is eventually when we solve for P, it's going to look like this, something in kilopascal. So that's what we're aiming for because I chose kilopascal. What I wrote here, don't worry about it. Just I'm just kind of giving you a hint about what's going to happen later. So now we need the volume. The volume is is a number that you should be understanding what, the, what it is from the question. 8.67 liters. But the temperature is messed up. Because the temperature here is 48.58 uh, degrees Celsius. And that's no good. Because the units for R have to be in something called K. So so there's a conversion Celsius to Kelvins. Where did the 8.31 come from in R? It's from the 
uh, the formula here for this uh, formula PV equals NRT. R is a constant. R is the constant. And R, R has values of these two things. You can choose either of them. So I just chose the second one because I felt like it. But you could have used the other one as well, Julian. Okay? Okay, so back here, Celsius to Kelvins is a bit of an issue because we don't, uh, we have Celsius. Now, there's an example earlier in the notes that I skipped on purpose because I want you to research it. But temperature in Kelvin equals temperature in Celsius 273.15. So in order to get temperature correct here, we got to add 273.15. And whatever that is, three two one seven three. So well, that should seal the deal with the uh, computation. Now, if you haven't taken physics in high school, you might be overwhelmed here, or even chemistry. Like this would have been an entire like lesson or two. So I'm not. No one's asking you to turn into chemists or physicists like overnight and at all. I just want you to know that there was a formula and you know you know how to take that formula and put the stuff in it and do something useful in terms of a calculation. That's what we're trying to do here. That's the only exercise here is is to build your confidence with using formulas. So I'm just going to put all the information in and see what happens. Yeah, exactly, Siddharth. Kind of unfamiliar with formula, but the math makes sense. You know what? what's nice? That is exactly the, the audience that I'm targeting for this explanation, is that you can just plug the numbers. Oh, yeah, it's being recorded. Absolutely, Jordan. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I might do? I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to do – I took up some of these ones today with you guys. What I'll do is I'll take up other ones with my other sections, and then I'll just combine them all into one video. So you'll have like, I'll try to cover other formulas with other sections so that you get like, a, you know, a medley of things. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, that is a very famous uh, conversion that um, would be given to you. Okay. So Matthew, you're not a psychic. That That's a formula. That's actually a formula from physics somewhere. If you want to convert from Celsius to Kelvin for temperature, you add 273.15. Is that is that the is that address, does that address your question well? Or, okay, if you want though, I didn't know Matthew how how you're welcome. I didn't know how how advanced your question was, but because uh, another another thing is that zero. If you didn't know this, zero Kelvin is absolute zero. Zero Kelvin is the lowest possible temperature. It's when uh, when there is absolutely nothing below that. So that's why they say absolute zero. That refers to Kelvin. So 273, um, actually, it's kind of cool here. If Celsius was negative 273, that's the lowest temperature possible. You can't go lower than negative 273 Celsius. So we're going to put all these numbers in here, 3.12. I got to do a little bit of gymnastics here. I have to delete the spaces to do that trick. It's so weird. <laughs> I, uh, I, I second that. <laughs> I guess I'm taking it that you took uh, physics or chemistry, Irvin. Which one was it? Oh, yeah. Gas laws. Boyle, Charles, all those ones, yeah. Fun times, fun times. Not that I'm trying to do a product placement. It's because you didn't have me as your tutor or your teacher, I mean. 
I would have made it even worse. Hopefully better. But anyway, that's off topic. Okay, anyway, like this question here. This is some random formula that maybe in your entire career as a science uh, student, you'd never see. Would R be constant? Yeah, R is constant, yeah. Yeah, that, I, I mean, it's a constant. Like, I, I don't... If you had to do more of these questions, you don't have to state it every time, I guess. You're welcome. So I think I've traumatized you enough with formulas. So what I'm going to do is do some surface area and, and volume calculations. I just want to take you quickly to question 31. We're not answering 31, okay? I'm not answering 31 with you. I'm just going to put a little box here and put math. Whoops. Math 1181. So as you guys know, you're, do, you're doing a second course with me called Math 1181. And, uh, and these questions are from Math 1181. I put them in here if anybody wanted to read ahead, that's all. So I'm not trying to hurt your, uh, hurt your brain too much today. R is the gas constant, correct? Okay, so let's try a question here involving a sphere. I'm not sure if you uh, have these handy anywhere else in your in your in your life with uh, units and uh, formulas, but I, I think that you'll need this paper for your quiz next week. See these formulas here for surface area and volume and what have you. I probably will ask you at least one surface area or volume question on your quiz next week. So I recommend that you uh, take a take a gander at these questions at these formulas. So if you don't have to print these booklets every week, but if you have access to a printer or at least have this on your screen somewhere on your phone or on, on a separate tablet or something, have these formulas here or have the conversions here when in your quiz next week, okay? Because I don't, uh, I don't necessarily think you'll be given the formulas when you're writing the quiz. Like, if you need to know the volume of a sphere or something, it's not something that's going to be, like, obvious. Although, if you're having a big, like, if you're getting stressed out during the quiz next week, and you're like, hey, sir, what's the volume for, uh, what's the volume of a sphere or something? I'll type it in the chat, or I'll show you on the screen. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be a, a mean person and not share a formula, because you could easily just Google it anyway. Anyway, find the surface area of a sphere. Let's do that here. So the surface area of a sphere is going to be what? Anybody remember the surface area of a sphere? That's nice. Thank you, Jai. 4 pi r squared. So in this case, it's 4 pi 7.85 inches. I don't care if you put the units in there. I don't care if you put the units in there, okay? I, I just put the units because I'm frozen. Can someone confirm the screen is working correctly? It's working for me. Okay. Um, who asked the question? Sorry, Julian, maybe pop out and come back in. I don't know. Not sure. I'm going to drop the inches there because it's actually confusing me sometimes when I put the units there. I, I want to keep it simple right now. So, number 40. So, let's try these questions out. Anybody got a number there? Yeah. Thank you, Anthony. I'm going to go to three sig figs and put 744. That's good. That's good. All right. Uh, let's go to 41. Find the volume of a sphere. Okay. So another another sphere question. Volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. So if you don't have these memorized, it doesn't matter. You can look them up. Nobody's gonna bug you. 
I'm just uh, kind of putting two and two together here by seeing that we have a formula, we have units. So expect to see unit conversions and formulas on your next uh, quiz, like next quiz. So the radius is 7.85 inches. So anybody have a volume for the class here? To three significant digits. I got 2000 something. Yes, thank you, Jason. And I'm gonna take your answer. Peter's good too. I'm gonna take your answer and I'm gonna round it to three significant digits as 2030. Because the zero at the end here, this zero that I'm highlighting is not significant. It's a place value. So uh, now time for some fun. Got a couple more questions here just to kind of whet your appetite. And then with the remaining time, I'll dip back and I'll do maybe one of the homework questions. So uh, anyway, find the lateral area or slant area of a square base pyramid with a base perimeter of this and a slant height of that. So if you're probably like, you're probably just like, what the heck is a slant area? So uh, when you have a pyramid, Hopefully I can draw the thing here without the without the uh, stylus freezing on me. Whoops. So if you have a pyramid, pray for the pyramid that it survives here, okay? Okay, it's not too bad. Anyway, the slant area, if this is the base down here, the slant area is the is the area of all the walls, all the sides that are moving up here. So these areas here, the vertical areas. So the slant area is the side of all of the vertical faces. Okay, so the formula for slant area for a pyramid is actually really, really, really cheap because uh, it involves some very simple numbers here. Slant area, area equals half PS. We'll talk about what PS are. So P, let me just mention that at the top here. Perimeter of the base is P. And the uh, slant height is S. You'll notice that my pyramid is kind of messed up because the question says square based. So let's uh, revoke that pyramid. It slows down the computer so that it doesn't take up too much of the network. So the perimeter of the base is the perimeter of the square at the bottom. So the square bottom here has a perimeter of 349 feet. And the slant height is 295 feet, which you can then put into this formula and call it a day. So that's uh, 349, so 295. If you're like, did you know that really off the top of your head? Uh, the answer is no. I didn't know that off the top of my head. Uh, slant areas uh, for, for pyramids is not something that I keep in my brain very often. But what I want to mention is that you just you have an index of formulas that you can look up and find these things. So the only reason I didn't scroll up to the table and I kind of cheated was to save myself five seconds of, uh, of scrolling. That's all. So anyway, you want to round this to uh, three significant digits. But first, keep in mind that you want to first write it in square feet. 
So this is going to be 51477.5 square feet. And you'll notice that this question is not done. What's the problem with this answer? Any any thoughts on that? Why is this answer not not finished? Yeah, you want yards. Thank you. So we're gonna multiply by we're gonna multiply by uh so you see how this is coming full circle now to what we did at the beginning. That's that's what I was getting at. So you're gonna have here uh one yard is three feet, if you recall. If you don't remember that on the quiz, that's why you gotta have the booklet. Uh, because the question says it somewhere here, Jordan, uh, express your answer in square yards. Sounds good. So you get approximately, uh, 5,720 square yards. Um, do you mean here? Why are there no yards here? Is that your question for BD? Oh, shoot. Yeah, my bad. My bad. I said it, but I wrote it the other way. That's what just happened. I, ha I think I have a problem that I can't type and talk at the same time. I'm so sorry, everybody. I have I seem to having an issue typing and talking today. I need to I need to lower my expectations on my abilities this morning. So sorry about that. Although I could do that, I could totally lie to you and just say, oh, I was seeing if you were checking. So anyway, I'm lying. That's I, I made a mistake. Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> let's have a good laugh and move on with our lives. Um, okay. So notice that these surface area and volume questions. I didn't give you a cube. I didn't give you a rectangular box. I didn't give you a circle. I didn't give you things that you've seen so many times that you could recite them till you fainted, right? I only pick spheres and cones and pyramids or what have you here because those, those are the hard ones. Why would I show you the easy one? Why am I going to show you the easy question? And then you go do your homework and you're like, he did the easy one in class and left the hard one for me to do. So hopefully uh, you can appreciate that at least. So we're going to try the next question, which is actually very similar to the uh, previous question. So for this, I'm just going to I'm going to try to get a, a square base pyramid for a second. Thank you, Google. There's a pyramid. So we have a square base pyramid, the base perimeter. The base perimeter is three, four, nine feet. The slant height, which is this uh, diagonal uh, height here is uh, 295 feet. The slant height is this height here along the face of the pyramid. If you know the perimeter is 349 uh, feet, then the edge length, because it's a square, would be what? Well, it's a square, so it's going to be a quarter. 349 over 4 feet, which is 87.25 feet.
So there's a few thoughts on the page, just to get them out of the way. The question's asking for the volume of a square base pyramid. So all I've done is just presented some of the uh, more obvious information in the question. I'll mention the slant height is this thing here. Whoops. That's the slant height, which is S. And that's P, which is the uh, perimeter of the base. And then this is just the length of one of the sides of the base. So what we want to do now is find the vertical height of the pyramid, because the formula is really weird. So the pyramid is uh, here. Oh, volume, sorry, volume. So we want that. We know what the base is because that's the area of the base of the pyramid. So I'll just state the area of the beer. The base is equal to 87.25 squared, because it's a square, which is 7612.56 square feet. And the only thing left to do is actually find the height of the pyramid. That's not an easy calculation. So uh, there's no real way to sugarcoat this. The height of the pyramid is, uh, is a very annoying diagram. So let's see here. Some of we drawn it. So there's a nice little question there. Uh, you can use Sokotoa, but I'm going to use the Pythagorean theorem. Vittorio, you're very you're very on point with that. I think Pythagorean theorem is good enough here. Okay. So this diagram will support how you would answer that question. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw it here. This one's annoying, but uh, it's the worst formula for today probably. The height of the pyramid is going to be based on the Pythagorean theorem. It's going to be the slant height minus the edge length divided by 2. Oh, that's not good. OK, fine. Now it's, now it's kind of annoying me. Sorry, guys. So it's like that. So the edge length is 87.25 divided by 2. And the uh, slant height, the slant height is uh, 295.
giving us a height for the pyramid, which is 291.75 or 76 is fine. Okay, I think that's enough. Once you have the base, once you have the base and you have the height, and by base I mean base area, then you can find out the era volume of the pyramid using the formula. So you can use this formula now. Do we have a red color? Let's take a look here. So you use that formula to finish. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll write down the answer, but I'll do it during your assignment because or your quiz, because I don't want you to I don't want you to worry too much about this question right now. I need you guys to take a mental break for five minutes so that you can write your quiz. Yeah. Why don't we do why don't we uh We'll walk through it again right now for BD, but just, uh, I'll, is, is it, uh, this part is okay? Is this part on the left okay? Okay, so it's this part here, right? Uh, yeah, the answer that you have, uh, Jason, is perfect. Just convert that to cubic, cubic yards after, but your answer is per good, okay? Now, yeah, Jordan, this question is definitely the hardest surface area volume question you're going to see ever. So, yeah, it's just a piece of garbage. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, and then this is not something I intend to cover in two minutes. So it's meant this is meant to be covered like over 10 minutes, you know, but I didn't have much time with you left. So I was like, let me just set it up. Okay, we'll talk about this so that, that I, we can move on to the, uh, you can have time to do the quiz. You don't have to write the quiz right at 11, so don't worry. Um but I just want to give you time. So see this guy here? That is equal to, uh, that is equal to not 87.25, but half of it. Because this thing here is 87.25, that whole thing across. So that's what this is. And then this here is S, which is your slant height. So you want to find the height here. You want to find the thing in green right here, h. So it's Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. But I've rearranged it. I've rearranged it, as you can see, because you're solving for h. It's going to be a square root with a minus sign. So that's that's the uh, express version of the Pythagorean theorem. So you're welcome. I'll write, I, I mean, my answer that I post on Blackboard is way longer than what I've written here, but I just thought I, I really want to drop uh, drop some pictures on you. We're going to do, thank you. Um, we're going to do a lot of questions on trigonometry later. So for, you're welcome. All good. I I, I got the, I, I, even if you said that, it would be a little bit cool because it'd be like, chill, sit. Okay. Anyway, uh, I'm going to stop there. So I'm just going to uh, now show you some more video from other lectures during the week and uh, just some more worked examples. We're just going to practice uh, looking at a formula and uh, and we're going to uh, just see kind of like uh, how I how I approach formulas and how you can as well. So I don't care if you've studied physics or not, because that doesn't really uh, matter right now. So if you don't know the formula for work, this is what I'm saying. You're going to go to building science and your professor is going to write a formula like work on the board. And, and they're going to be like, oh, this is the formula for work. And you're the, what, I don't want you to be like freaking out because it's a formula and you've never seen it before. Whenever you encounter a formula, you can do what I do here. So this table here is something it's a bit overkill. But this table is what I do when I want to dissect or in a more colloquial way, kick the crap out of a formula. So what I do is I just fill the table in. So over here, the symbol for work is W. The units are Newton meters or joules. 
And then we can have force. The symbol for force is F. And, whoops, the symbol for distance is D. The units for force are Newtons. And the units for distance or displacement, if you know physics, are meters. So I'm not saying that, like, I filled this table in pretty casually. But the thing is, is that if you're like, I didn't know the units for work were that. I didn't know that the units for force were N, which is Newtons. It's okay. I'll get to that in a second, Joshua. All of the units in the question are given to you. So to answer your question, Joshua, you do not need to know physics for this class. But what you do need to know is that if you are given some random formula from wherever, physics, finance, you name it, chemistry. If I give you a formula from some random topic in science, you need to know how to rearrange it and put the information in it to evaluate or find something and make sure that you present the correct units. So that's what I want from you. I don't care, I don't care, Joshua, if you know this formula, work equals force times distance, what it means. I just, we're not analyzing it to that level. Uh, next semester, we are going to do uh, about 50% of your course next semester is physics based. I'm going to teach you some of the, uh, the uh, foundations in physics to assist you for your statics course in second year. Statics is when you analyze like structures and you want to find the forces or whatever inside the, the, the structure. So I'm going to be teaching you some physics to help you have a foundation for that. And uh, that, that is custom, that, that's something that I've myself, I designed the course. If you want to get a taste, if you want to get a taste of what the physics is that you're going to do next semester, I've left some of the lessons on YouTube, on, on my channel on YouTube from last year. Although I might, uh, I might uh, like take them back and because I'm going to try to do a better job this year of delivering it. Those lessons were done like exactly when COVID started, like the whole like shutdown stuff started. That's when I, that's when I made those lessons. So they're my first YouTube videos. So they're not to my standard, but anyway, whatever. Okay. The next thing when you have a formula is that you want to rearrange it. So I know that force equals... Well, you tell me what this force equal. Can you rearrange for F? What would F equal? Yep. Thanks, Yazan. And you can also solve for D. If you solve for D here, you get that. So that's what I mean by just dissecting a formula, being able to write the symbols, the units, and being able to rearrange the formula all the different ways. Imagine this, that what we did here, imagine that you had the, another like 10 or 15 formulas where you do this analysis because that's what we're going to be doing in this booklet. Although we can't do all of them in, in the time that we have, I've taken these tables, which if you flip through the book, there's about a dozen of them or so. I've taken two or three and done them on Tuesday. I'm going to do a few more with you guys. And then tomorrow I'm going to do a few more with the other section and then put all the different uh, lessons of those things together. It's going to be not the best video editing, but I'm going to put them all together and put them on YouTube. It'll be kind of a, a hack job because of the different sections and kind of putting them together. For D, is there any difference if you put the F on the top or the W on the bottom? Yeah, because you, uh, you, want, you want it to be isolated. W has to be on top. If you solve for D here, W has to be on top because you divide both sides by F. I'm missing, I'm missing the point there. This one here, right? Okay. Yeah, W has to be on top. Yeah, because you're just rearranging it. You're welcome. You're just taking this equation here, 
you're taking this equation here and you're just solving for uh, for uh, D. So you have to divide by F on both sides. So it's W over F. Once you've used the formula, or sorry, once you've created the formula and analyzed it, I should say, then you can take it for a little test drive. So let's do a let's do an application here. So work equals work equals force times distance. So in this case, the force is 7.21 kilonewtons. And the distance is 512 centimeters. Um, any comments here about the uh, about the question? Yeah, you got to convert. Thank you, Graham. The units are not looking too nice. So we can convert newtons, kilonewtons to newtons, because k k means a thousand. So this is seven two one zero newtons. And centimeters, you, that was one of the first questions. You guys nailed that. So I'm just going to go to the meters right away. See, I didn't do the fraction stuff here. I didn't go all fancy on you because the conversions, are they're not vol something. It's just You can just do the quick way. And then you can multiply that out. I'm going to go to three significant digits, although the question doesn't specify. So if you round it with less or more, it's fine. So there's the answer. So again, here I'm doing three significant digits, although it is not specified in the question. For your quizzes, for your quizzes, because I'm uh, really just relying on the platform for the for the um, formatting and such, you're not going to see uh, me be very picky about significant digits or, or things like that. However, on your midterm. It will be marked uh, more strict, and I will be I will be looking for things like significant digits and and the units if necessary or what have you. Uh, that's just something to keep in mind for for uh, eventually for week seven when you write your midterm. Although your midterm is not worth like a fortune, your midterm is worth twenty five percent. But by that point, you've written five quizzes which are worth twenty five percent also. Anyway. Um, we're not going to do question 20 because I already did it with the other section. So I will post the solution to 20 in, when I do the whole uh, YouTube uh, editing on Friday. So the next question I want to cover with you is question 24. So let's go to 24. So there's three laws here related to ga gases. So if you've taken uh, chemistry in grade 11, you probably have experienced the ideal, uh, sorry, the ideal gas law for sure, and the combined gas law as well. So here's the combined gas law. And it's just a law that comes from very uh, fundamental theory and that was studied hundreds of years ago by scientists like Boyles, Charles and Gay Lussac. So these uh, these uh, laws here are just uh, subsets of this law. So let's talk about uh, creating some formulas here. You're gonna need to know this law here. You, you're gonna need to know this formula, like not not to create it, but to use it, I should say, in uh, in building science. So what this is telling you is that. If you have a fixed volume of uh, a fixed mass or quantity of gas, and then there's a certain pressure that it is uh, subject to, and it's at a certain temperature, and it's contained within a certain volume, that if you change the pressure, volume, or temperature a certain way, that the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature before and after is, is such. In other words, the product of pressure and volume divided by temperature will remain constant. Now, sometimes you have gas that is under a certain condition where uh, maybe the pressure is not changing or the temperature is not changing or the volume is not changing. 
And that's how you get uh, these different laws. So there's the laws called uh, Boyle's Law, Charles Law, and Gay-Lussac Law. So what I'm going to do is just kind of do this here. I'm going to do it the cheap way. So if you look at the statements above, it says here that if the temperature is constant, then the gas law is Boyle's law. In other words, if the temperature is the same, then you don't need the fraction because the temperature is constant. In other words, T1 equals T2. So you can just scratch it out. Okay. Charles law is if the pressure is constant. So if the pressure is constant, you get Charles law. So you can ditch the pressure. And then Gay-Lussac law is if the volume is constant. I'm not asking you to philosophically describe why each of the laws are the way they are. These were uh, these laws here were found by experiment. What I do want you to be able to do is if you're given a formula like this, not so much on your quizzes, but maybe on your midterm, <coughs> excuse me, that you should be able to uh, do the calculations here. So let's try a question. Let's take this for a little test drive. So we have a... Uh, A gas is enclosed in a flexible container. And it says that the pressure is held constant. Okay. So what's going to happen is you're going to compress the container. So let's say that you have like a, a balloon or something and you squeeze it. So you, you, you shrink the volume. That means that the pressure, the temperature might should change. And if the pressure is fixed, because you can do it under conditions where the pressure doesn't change, then that temperature is either going to rise or fall to react to the change in the volume. So one of these formulas describes how the connection is between temperature and volume when pressure is constant. So which of these three laws here is the one where pressure is constant? Charles is correct. Thank you. So, so Charles Law says So let's see if we have these things. Do we know V1? What's V1? I mean, what could you, what could you call V1? Yeah, 20.8. V2, 12.9. V1. What's T1? Good. But there's a problem here. Um, and this is kind of pointed out in the question that temperature must be in Kelvin. Temperatures must be in kelvins. So yeah, you got to add to 73.15. That was the conversion that we did earlier. So if we do that conversion here, we get 312. If anybody is getting nervous about this question, I want to explicitly tell you, this is not on your quiz next week, this particular formula stuff. 
all I want you to be able to do in the long run is if I give you a formula later, you're able to take the formula and do something with it. So this kind of question is more for like an assignment or a project or whatever. When you take building science next semester though, the teacher is gonna expect you to be like me on the screen. That's the formula, that's what I put the units in, blah, blah, blah. So if you're worried about me doing all the calculations and you're getting scared, um, just put that fear aside because you're, this is not a physics class right now, okay? This is just me saying, hey, look, it's a formula. You can put some stuff in it. So just keep that in mind. This question, the formula is not that hard to use, and I don't think you're intimidated. But for those of you who have not studied chemistry, you probably didn't know that you had to convert to Kelvins. Um, although the question says it, uh, like the, the formula up here in 24, if you look higher, it says... The temperature is in Kelvins. See that? The temperature is in Kelvins, is forced on you. So that's why I'm doing that conversion. Anyway, we can shove in all the numbers now. Yes. What's up, Kyle? Yeah, it's 298. You're right. I'm sorry. 298.15. I can't believe I missed that. I was looking at, uh, I had some, I wrote some stuff on the side on the scrap paper here and I, I copied the wrong number. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you. So we want to find uh, T2. So the question is, T2 equals question mark. So we have here T2, unknown. T1 is 298.32. V1 is uh, 20.8, and that's 12.9. I'm not going to write the algebra for this. You should be able to do that, hopefully, by this point. So T2 eventually, give me a number. What did you guys get in Kelvin? 180 something maybe? Yeah, definitely cold. Yeah. What was your, what was your number? <laughs> yeah, 185, yeah. Yeah, definitely cold. I, I would agree with you there. So you want to convert that to Celsius. So what you can do is you can say here, uh, E2 is equal to negative, very cold. I, has it ever hit negative 88 in modern times, you think? You think anywhere on the earth has gone negative 88? I think so too. Was it in was it in Antarctica? Yeah. What was the lowest that went there in the past like hundred years? Or it was, I, I remember reading an article about this somewhere. It was pretty damn cold. <laughs> we want to be there. Yeah. Got to check that out. That's a fact finding mission right there. Um. Wow. July 21st, 1983. Jeez. And that's uh, that's the extent of the formulas. So, I, I mean, I didn't want to put them in this course book to scare anybody. But for those that want to think ahead or look ahead to what you might see in terms of uh, uh, physics type of stuff with me next semester, I threw those formulas in there as well just to support you there. So uh, what we're going to do now is shift our attention to doing uh, maybe one estimating type question or one calculation, cost calculation question. And then after that, we're going to spend the rest of the time today just reviewing some easier stuff on uh, surface area and volume. So let's just do one question involving cost calculation. And I'm going to leave the remaining questions for you to try on your own. They're not hard questions, uh, but I just didn't want to... Uh, 
do too many formula questions with you today, really. So let's do this question here. So a room has uh, some dimensions and you want to install flooring. You can tell me later if I'm overcharging. So if I'm, if I'm ripping anybody off in this question, you can, you can, you can uh, fill in the survey at, in the, uh, in the chat there and talk to the manager because like I'm just the employee. So whatever. Anyway, why don't you have a go at that one? We'll, we'll start taking it up in a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah. I think it's made of my favorite hockey cards, Graham. <laughs> hilarious. You guys are hilarious. I had I remember doing a question like this in class a couple years ago, and one of the guys in the class was literally a flooring expert, and he goes, sir, you're ripping us off. So I just kind of bowed my head in shame and then walked away. Anyway, uh, Okay, let's see what's going on here. We have uh, we have some some dimensions to the room, and it's gonna take 14 hours to complete the job. Yeah, it's supposed to be kind of around there. I mean, I, I had to do my flooring in my place uh, after a flood, so I know about that. <laughs> 17 times 23. Okay, is uh, 391. By the way. Are you guys interested if I make a video on my YouTube channel where I can show you some ridiculously quick mental math tricks? Is that? Okay, cool. All right. Yeah, I got a, I got a lot of, I got a lot of yeses there. I'll uh I don't know if I can show you. Wow. I think that's yeah. I'm going to I'm going to totally do that. I'm going to show you how you can uh some crazy tricks that don't involve uh, too much brain power. I am not a lazy person, but I won't do, I don't like to do things in my head that I, that I could use a calculator for if it's too annoying. Anyway, uh, we got 391 square feet, so we need to calculate the material and the labor. So the material and the labor, and I spelt it the Canadian way. So anyway, so we have 391 square feet times a very overpriced $17 per square foot. So 391, that's a lot of money. Yikes, yeah, I know. You know how many clients I have? Zero. I got to look for a new job. And then we have uh, 14 hours times $36 per hour. My labor is killing me too. 36 an hour. Jeez. Oh, shoot. I was taking your word on the calculation. I missed, I missed up. So obviously you don't want to do business with me if I don't know how to add numbers, right? Total cost, what would you have there? 7151, you said. Yeah, I think 36 is fair. Maybe if this video, if I if I publish this video in, in 20 years, someone looks at it, this guy's going to be like, wow, that guy's cheap. Not going to do, not going to work for him. He's a cheapskate. I, I, you know, you know how, you know, inflation, right? Inflation, how the price of things goes up, but whatever. That definitely depends on experience. My, my philosophy on inflation is very simple. I call it the subway index. Yeah, true. It depends on how fast they get the job. So when I was a teenager, many decades ago, um, a subway sub cost like five bucks. Now it's more like $9. True, true. No, no, I did, yeah, actually, no. Actually, the TTC also is another one. So when I was in high school, bus fare was two dollars, and maybe two twenty-five by the end of university. Now, what is it like three and change? 
I have a I have a press that I haven't used my press though in like eight months because I don't go anywhere. Anyway. Um, there's some other questions on estimating for you guys to try on your own. Uh, just uh, evaluating alternatives. But uh, we're going to just move on to surface area and volume now because uh, that's really the, uh, that's really the, uh, sorry, the focus of your evaluation next week is on, is on unit conversions and surface areas and volumes. So you'll see questions 38 to 43 are, are surface area and volume questions. We're not going to do every single one. I'm just going to, I think I did a few with the other class that were different. So I might do ones with you on the other side of the coin too, so that we can have a full set of solutions. Although I will post the complete set at the end of, at the end of class. So here we have a, a rectangular uh, prism is the shape of the excavation for a foundation of a building. Now, when you excavate a foundation of a, for, for the foundation of a building, it's not exactly the shape of a rectangular prism. So imagine that you're digging in the ground. See my hands there? You don't dig like that. There's a little bit of this because you're dealing with earth and it's going to cave a little bit. So with, and even if you shore it up, it doesn't matter. You're still going to have that. It's going to have a more of a trapezoid shape. It's going to actually be more of a, a pyramid shape, uh, an inverted uh, frustum of a pyramid. That's a nice one. Google image this one. Frustum of a pyramid, of a square-based pyramid. I'm typing it in the chat. That's a more realistic shape for the uh, the excavation for a construction site for a rectangle, uh, for an area that's rectangular, a plan area. So anyway, off topic here. Let's get back to the actual question. Oops. I already had a text box there, so we can do the volume. So we have 17.95 meters by 11.95 meters by 18.23 meters. Let's get that to a decimal. So what's the answer to three significant figures? <clears throat> Excuse me. Anybody got a number on that? Anybody? Yes, 39.10. Three sig figs. Oh, four. Yeah, four. Uh, what do you have at the four sig figs? Yeah, so this is a good point, Graham. Like, because the zero here is significant. So how do we mo how do we manage that? I don't want you to worry about it too much. What you could do is put a dot there, or you can write what Graham wrote in the chat. Uh, the, the Graham's answer in the chat is the most ironclad way, which is to put it in a uh, engineering or scientific type notation. So to 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 round to do that well, four sig figs. Method one would be this three nine one point zero. You could also put 3.910. I'm going to shift it over because I want it to be in proper scientific notation. And then yet another way to do it is to do this. Where the heck is it? That's a third way to do it. Is you put a bar. You put a bar on the zero to tag it. Obviously, with the computer delivery, how you would type an answer on, on the actual platform for your tests and quizzes, this type of scenario is expected that you're going to get, there's a 1 in 10 chance you're going to get something annoying with the sig figs. So if you just wrote 3910 and you didn't like decorate it with the stuff I'm doing here, you're all good, okay? Everything's just fine. So if that happens, it's just a situation of bad luck, and I'm well aware of it. In fact, when I design questions, I try to avoid it. Thank you, Graham. So let's try something different. That was kind of fun, but we need something else. This is more of a realistic question. 
we take the previous thing, which is that we know that it's 3910 cubic meters. So let's write that down here. 3910. This time we want to figure out deliveries. So it says here that a truck can carry 11 cubic meters per load at $175 per trip. How much will it cost you to deliver the material away from the construction site? So as a manager, you would want to know this in your estimates when you're considering booking uh, delivery or removal of, uh, of waste or, or soil in this case. So what's, gonna, what's the process? Well, I don't know, but you know the table on page three that I gave you, like metric and imperial? I didn't see delivery trucks in that table. So this is where you want to make a conversion, like I showed you, whoops, like I showed you earlier today which is just to make a fraction. So we know that it takes one truckload is worth 11 cubic meters. So you can do a conversion like that, even though truckload is not a conventional unit in the units that I presented, because in this case, it, the truckloads are whatever ones you were considering here. Maybe it's a certain type of model of truck, but maybe if you're in Europe or something and they use smaller trucks or larger trucks, or somewhere else in the world, though this unit conversion is specific to the scenario that you're looking at. Ultimately, you can divide by that and get, what do you get there? What's 3910 divided by 11? Good, okay. So we have an interesting scenario here, okay? I'm gonna write down Kyle's answer, which is the numerical answer. Thank you very much, Kyle. And, and then we have the beautiful follow-up. So I think Matthew and Kyle will work very well in a group project. Um, so hook it up, guys. So uh, anyway, this answer is good, but you should round it to 356. So why do you go 356, Matthew? Can you tell us in the chat? Why is it 356? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty true, Graham. Yeah, thank you, Adnan, because you got you still got 0.45 of a truckload left. You always have to round up when it comes to things like that. Like if I if I go to Home Depot, okay, and I need a no no, if I need at home, I need uh, three and a half feet of copper pipe. I'm not and, and Home Depot sells it by the foot. I'm not gonna go to Home Depot and say yeah, give me three feet and then just give me a half a foot on the side. No, I gotta buy four feet. Too bad. You know, get over it, right? <laughs> so 356 truckloads, let's talk about money now. And that's going to be 175 per trip. I hope you like this fraction thing that I'm showing you here because it really pays off now. So how much money to the nearest uh, thousands? Two sick figs, right? So I got that. Can someone confirm 62,000? Thank you very much. Okay, so the next uh, set of questions involves uh, surface area and volumes of uh, some funny shapes involving uh, spheres and cones. 